Uh, my name is Gary Olson. I'm a furniture maker. I have a small workshop in Wilmslow, Cheshire, just south of Manchester, and I make one-off pieces that are contemporary, mostly to commission. My uh, background was teaching. I was very conscious of not having many practical skills, and when I moved to England from Australia 30 years ago, I decided that I was going to develop a craft. That's how I got into it, and maybe it was in my blood because my Swedish grandfather was a ship's carpenter. Okay. The sort of clients that come to me are usually middle-class, middle-aged, well-educated people who understand that when they pay a little bit of extra for something that's handmade, they're getting something distinctive that is unique to them, and that it's worth paying that bit extra because they're going to have something that will be passed on through the family as an heirloom. So they can't find it off the shelf, so to speak, but they come to you with an idea of what they're looking for? What kind of brief do they give you? Often the sort of questions that com clients come to me with are, we haven't been able to find what we want in the shops. We need a dining table, for example, that has to fit a certain space and seat a certain number of people. Would you be able to make us one? Can you come to the house and design something that would suit our needs mm. and in that case they get something that's just right for them mm. so you would actually do a site visit you'd go to their house and look at the space and then make a suggestion as to what you could do all the time yeah. yes that's the way it works yeah. uh, very very rarely people come with a specific drawing and tell me what they'd like me to make mm. that has happened a couple of times on one scary occasion I was told you're the artist and designer you make what you think we'd like but I felt very uncomfortable with that the vast majority of times people will invite me to make suggestions and then I will involve them in the discussion so it's a joint process where together we come up with something that they're happy with. Mm. What's the most unusual thing you've made for a client, Gary? The most unusual thing? That's a, uh, <laughs> a question that um, I don't think I've been asked before. I once had someone who had opened the batting for Lancashire a long time ago and having been hit in the eye by a fast bowler always got a an pain in his right eye, which was the side of his mouth that he liked to hang his pipe. So I had to make his pipe a bit smaller by cutting a quarter of an inch off the top of the bowl. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say you needed a left-handed pipe or something. <laughs> and do you no, make cricket bats? No, no oh, only, uh, only one to mess about with in the workshop yard right. at lunchtime. But I believe there was somebody who came into the showroom and oh. plonk something down on the table. That was a, there was a classic example of the dangers when the gas man came in with a clipboard and threw it on top of a desk that I had a price of £5,000 on, <laughs> and he scratched the top to the point where it had to be refinished oh at great time and expense. Let's get on to the subject of sustainable materials, because it's a very controversial topic now, the use of, of wood in the production of furniture. What, what are your views on it, and how do you apply those views into the work that you do? If you're using solid timber straight from the tree, it's not controversial at all. It's the most perfect sustainable material mm. because it grows without us having to give it any input to. The key is that the tree, while it's growing, is good for the environment. It's taking in car carbon dioxide and refreshing the in the atmosphere so it's the perfect sustainable material as long as we don't cut down more than we take so the ideal is that if we're cut down if we cut down one tree we plant three and I've made a point in my working life of always trying to give back more than I take mm. so I have worked in projects where we've raised funds for tree planting and I've always made sure that I put back more than I take. If everyone took that attitude, there's no problem, and we are working with the best material possible. Mm. Now, Gary, tell us about the One Tree Project. It was something that developed from my workshop with a colleague, Peter Toeg, who worked with me at the time. We were stunned by a client who came in and saw a nicely polished piece of furniture on the bench and then looked at a rough sawn plank of timber in the corner of the room and said, you didn't start with that, did you? Which indicates that she had no idea not only where the polished piece of furniture came from, but it also came from the thing growing outside mm. with the leaves on it. So this is like not knowing where the milk comes from or not knowing where bacon comes from. Exactly. Yes. So 
that stunned us. We also understood that there was a problem with managing the resource in this country. 80% of the timber used in Britain comes from uh, other countries, a lot of it from rainforests where the management of the forests is doubtful. We wanted to show that this was a valuable resource that we should manage in our own country. OK, so that set the scene about this, this desire that you had. What did you do as a result? What happened next? Well, we set up aims of developing a project that would show the value of trees as a resource. We also wanted to publicise the British arts and crafts. So we wrote to the National Trust and asked them if they could give us a tree. And uh, to cut the long story short, we were offered a tree from the National Trust estate, Tatton Park, mm -hmm. which was near where we are. And from that one large oak tree, we were able to develop a huge number of products using different artists and craftsmen. So different craftsmen creating different products in their own area of expertise. Give us some examples. Uh, there was a vast range. We used a couple of builders, a couple of joiners, but they're the sort of people's that, people that don't get involved in arts projects. Mm -hmm. We had lots of furniture makers like ourselves. We had several various crafts, such as paper makers using the leaves mm -hmm. to make, uh, make paper items. We had someone using the bark to tan leather. We had various sculptors of all sorts, mm -hmm. some who put things together, some who carved away. So was it, was it a little bit like, well, I have a bit of thigh and I want some breast and I'd like a leg? Were they all sort of after different bits of the tree? Exactly. We went through a long... Uh, selection process mm. where we finished up having over 70 artists and craftspeople. They all had to apply to the project with their ideas and once they were selected they gave us a very specific cutting list and we tried to give them exactly what they wanted mm. them wanted so they could bring their idea to fruition. Fantastic. And how long did it take? Did you have a cut-off point when things had to be finished by? We had a very specific program. The tree was felled in the winter of 1998. Mm. Uh, the selection process was throughout 1999 when we started to uh, not only develop a, an exhibition program and ideas for how the project would develop, but we also started to distribute the timber. It was long-winded because we had to season the timber. You can't use it straight away. And once it was milled into planks, we had to let it dry out mm. for a long while. And it was in the year 2000 that all of the timber was distributed and that that was the year of the making. And it was by the end of 2000 that everyone who was committed to the project mm. had to produce their final item. So tell us a little bit about where the items were displayed because they've been, on, they've been exhibited all over the place, haven't they? We used professional help through uh, exhibition curators who organised a tour for us to five different venues. It opened during the Edinburgh Festival of 2001, uh, in the summer of 2001, and that was at the Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh. They were wonderful hosts and it was a great place to be. From there it moved on to the Harley Gallery, which is near Welbeck in Nottinghamshire, then to the home of the tree at Tatton Park in Cheshire, then on to the Bristol City Art Gallery, and then to the Jeffrey Museum in East London, a museum that's famous for its furniture displays. So it was, had a particular interest. Mm. All of that took just over a year. We had over 100,000 people visit the exhibitions and a fantastic response from the press and all sorts of media. And I believe that the One Tree Project has, has spawned a number of, of copycat versions. Other people have done a similar thing. Yeah, we had a tremendous impact. Mm. And we didn't realise when we started what sort of impact we were going to have. But with the publicity included at least 200 articles in various journals and magazines and newspapers. But the most significant one was uh, CBS, the American News Corporation, sending a reporter from London to cover the One Tree Project. And I spent two days with him and his cameraman and he interviewed me over all aspects of the One Tree Project. I took him to Tatton Park during the exhibition, and I also took him around to various studios and workshops to, for him to meet some of the makers involved. Uh, from that, they produced a seven-minute item which went out on Sunday Morning, which is a magazine program on national television in the United mm. States. I had people ringing from the United States telling me that they'd seen me and that I had a prime spot just after Carly Simon.
As a result, it spread overseas, and we have since had 13 copycat exhibitions. Five of them are regional ones in this country, but others in Australia, the United States, Central and South America, and Canada. So we've um, been very, very pleased with the response. It was difficult after the One Tree Project to go back to being a mere cabinet maker because the highs were very yes. high. Uh, but I have settled back to what I used to do. I am now a member of the Northern Contemporary Furniture Makers, which is a group of craftspeople who are, all have similar ideals and aspirations to myself. We're looking for exhibition opportunities in the Manchester area and other parts of the North. And in general, I'm trying to promote the craft at the same time, move on and develop new ideas for myself and explore new customer bases rather than rely on the old one. And just finally, Gary, if there's a, if there's a parting message that you'd like to leave the listeners with about, you know, do you want to influence the way they think of wood or they think of furniture, what, what would that message be? Uh, the message is don't just assume that what you see in a high street shop is all that's available. It can be fun and interesting and also quite challenging but worthwhile to go to someone who is a craftsman, not just in timber, any sort of craftsperson or artist, and commission work that is special just for you. Mm. And I think that's an important message. If more people did that, we'd live in a more sustainable society because you'd be going to local people, supporting local businesses and creating employment in your own area mm. in jobs that are quite meaningful. Well, Gary Olson, you're clearly a man with mojo, so thank you for joining us. Thank you.